Welcome, and uh, thank you uh, for attending. And uh, I'll answer the question now. You had better be. Okay. The study of fire is a fascinating discipline because it integrates many um, disciplines. Um, study of climate, ecosystems, physics. Um, it's a fantastic thing to get into. And in particular, in the last 20 years, there's been a revolution in the way we look at fire because we can literally see fires from space. Um, that has given us the perspective of fire across the world, across the globe, um, which sets the scene for understanding what we're going to do around our own fire-prone environments. We can see fires from space now, and that enables us to generate beautiful maps like this um, based on about 10 years' worth of satellite information about fire activity across the world. Remarkable. Some places burn lots. Some places, um, in particular deserts and the polar regions, have no fire. Um, there's a set of climatic explanations for these incredible patterns of fire, including on our own continent, um, and uh, also human uh, causes of, and relationships with fire, which give us the, the basis for predicting where fire might go in the future, particularly in response to climatic change, um, changes in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, and changes in human populations. Um, in the scientific literature over the last 10 years, um, beautiful maps like this have been produced which project fire across the 21st century, particularly in relation to climate change. And you can see that fire is um, predicted to either expand or increase, and in some cases to decrease, um, as in particular um, um, particular parts of the world uh, heat up and dry out. And uh, if you have a look at this map, you'll see where we live in southern Australia, um, we can expect some sort of increase in fire in response to um, future dryness driven by warming. Ah, oh, that's great. That's all going to happen in 50, 60 years' time. I don't have to worry about that. Not so. Here is an image of a fire in the central west of the state which um, took place in the middle of February um, earlier this year under conditions, weather conditions of high wind speeds, high temperatures, etc., that were absolutely unprecedented, um, not really experienced in the historical record. The future has arrived. We can expect this to turn up on our doorsteps um, more often and perhaps in ways that we have never experienced um, in terms of the intensity of these fires. What are we going to do about it? Um, we live in a fire-prone um, part of the world, our local region, with huge exposure of uh, property and, and people. We've got a number of alternatives. We could attempt to eliminate all fires. Um, we could attempt to completely subjugate all fires. Neither of these are actually feasible, at least logistically and financially, which gives us a sort of a third option. We could learn to better coexist with fires. Hmm, what would that take? What would we need to do to fulfil a dream of coexisting with fires, particularly um, the way in which we've developed um, properties and uh, uh, urban settlements um, embedded within fire-prone forests, such as in our local region. First, we've got to transform our attitudes, awareness and actions. Um, we have to accept that fires are part of the furniture, they are inevitable, and in particular, we have to accept that we can actually use fire in a targeted way to mitigate the risk um, that we face. And we obviously need enhanced systems and, and knowledge that underpins those systems for the planning, um, preparation and prediction. So I'm going to give you some examples of these things and the stuff we're working on to make them happen. So, firstly, um, 
Every house in, fire, in a fire-prone situation is different. The construction standards, the history of the design, etc., the features of the house itself, and the surrounding environment um, within about 30 metres of that house, they're all different, um, different types of vegetation, gardens, etc. Each of these things influences the probability of loss should a fire arrive on the doorstep, in other words, risk. We need customised risk ratings for every individual house so that people have an informed basis on which to take action. Um, you will see in this uh, image two houses on the left which have uh, been destroyed and a house on the right that hasn't. The two houses that are destroyed are associated with overhanging tree cover ac across the roofs. Um, trees and houses don't mix particularly well, particularly uh, things like eucalypts, um, which are obviously uh, part of the furniture in our current environment. How can we be get a better handle on the situation? We have over half a million uh, houses on the front line of exposure in the Sydney region alone. Um, how can we develop better insights into um, how things are travelling in this regard? One of the things we've been doing is looking at a comprehensive inventory of tree and understory cover using airborne LIDAR, and it produces maps like this which um, tell us about the exposure or the, um, the risk factors for individual properties. Um, and that can then go into um, uh, information and education systems for homeowners. Well, I said trees and houses don't mix. Does that mean that we get out the chainsaw and um, lay waste to uh, uh, our environments um, next door to where we live? We might need to rethink and particularly re-engineer what I call the green curtain. Um, many people on the front line are living literally next to a green wall. Um, but to change that vegetation mix around houses, um, we can do that perhaps sympathetically by understanding the flammability of the plants in which we choose to live um, uh, within close proximity to. Um, many of our houses in the local region are surrounded by eucalypts um, uh, in the lower right-hand panel, which are extremely flammable. Can we, on the basis of scientific knowledge, substitute them with native species like these native conifers, which we know um, are of lower flammability? What is the scope for re-engineering the green curtain based on scientific evidence? It's a really fruitful and interesting and quite difficult line of research. As I indicated before, part of the way of adapting and coexisting in the future is to use fire deliberately um, to change uh, or mitigate risk via the alteration of bushland fuels, particularly in relatively close proximity to our developments. Here is a fire um, that's been deliberately lit, what's called a prescribed fire, in the Blue Mountains in May 2016. This is literally about 10 minutes after the ignition of that fire. It became substantially larger. It's been um, lit for risk mitigation purposes. However, there is a downside. That fire and a number of others um, ended up smoking out Sydney for a number of days um, and causing severe um, air pollution problems. But however, we now know that that sort of uh, smoke uh, situation, air pollution situation in the city um, is linked to uh, mortality uh, for people who uh, uh, you know, have respiratory and cardiovascular problems. In fact, this particular episode, now known as the Mother's Day event, um, probably resulted in 15 premature deaths. So we have this conundrum. Uh, we are using fire to mitigate risk but there is a downside where, if we're not careful, we can actually cause loss, um, premature loss of life. How do, we, uh, how do we develop tools and how do we solve this conundrum of balancing um, uh, this, these you know, seemingly opposing outcomes? Um, and what sort of tools can we use to, to try and refine the way we, we undertake these operations? Well, here's an, a really good example developed for Tasmania called the Aerator app, which people can use and access to understand the air pollution situation from fires and other sources 
in their local environment and we're going to be in the process of trying to um, uh, apply this more generally. The final example is um, we need to be able to warn people when fires are imminent, um, but we want to avoid warning fatigue. We don't want to warn people falsely because that may lead to complacency. So we want to be able to predict where fires, when and where they're going to happen. And one of those, uh, one of the things that we've been working on is ways of examining the, how the dryness of the landscape as a precondition for fires evolves in near real time. This is a situation in March earlier this year for the local region when it was wet. Um, so most of the, the landscape is green, which means it's wet. And by the time we've reached um, the middle of winter, um, not much rain and the brown stuff means it's drying out in a way which is, has been historically shown to be conducive to major fires. And just the other week, the landscape looks like this, uniformly brown, we have the preconditions for major fires in place. However, note that there are still some green patches. So we can use this sort of information to refine our preparedness and our warning systems, um, literally in the days and weeks ahead. To finish, um, here is an example um, in Victoria after the 2009 fires um, of a property um, which is up for sale. Um, the town up the road was pretty much substantially destroyed um, in those fires and many people died. These people obviously survived, but they've made a choice. They've decided perhaps they don't want to live there anymore. Perfectly valid decision. For those who want to stay and learn to coexist with fires, there's a lot that individual people on the front line can do to change their risk. So the future is substantially in their own hands. Thank you very much.